The Quran is a healing. The Quran is a healing for all of our sicknesses. The Quran is a healing for the sicknesses that we have inside of ourselves. And it is also a healing for the sicknesses we have outside of ourselves. A lot of times we look at our condition, whether we are looking at our condition within our families or our condition within our communities or our condition within the global landscape or our condition as a society globally we sometimes think that the reason that we are in the situation that we are is because of some external reason the Prophet وسلم, told us more than 1400 years ago about the situation that we find ourselves in today. In a very profound hadith, the Prophet وسلم, says that there will come a time when you will be like the froth on the ocean. Now, when you think about the ocean, you notice that there's waves, right? But then on top of the waves is this sort of these bubbles, right? Like just the froth. In this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ likens us. He says that there will come a time when, when the ummah, when we as Muslims will be like that. And the companions asked him, will it be because we are small in number? And, he's, and he replied and said, no, it will not be because you are small in number, but Allah will take the fear of you out of the hearts of your enemies. And will also, he says, that your enemies will gather one another to feast on you like wolves. You know wolves, and they gather one another to feast on prey. Your enemies will do that. And Allah will take the fear of you from the hearts of your enemies and then put in your hearts wahan. And when he defined this word, he defined it in two ways. Hubb dunya wa karahiyat al maut. Love of dunya and hatred of death. Why do we spend so much time talking about attachments? Why do we spend so much time talking about love of dunya? It's because of this. It's because it is this disease that we have in our hearts that is the reason why we are in the situation we're in, in this life and the next. It is because of wahan, it's because of this disease of love of dunya that we are weak, that we are weak when it comes to our family relationship, that we are weak as a community and that we are weak as an entire global ummah. We have become weak because we love this life too much. Don't give me all the other arguments that we don't have enough you know, military power or we don't have enough money or we don't have enough this or that. All these political arguments. The core of the reason is this. Because Allah says that He does not change the condition of a people until they change what is inside themselves. We can have all the political power. We can change and play around with the governments and the leaders. And we can have more military power and more money. But it will not change our condition until we change inside. And the same applies within our personal relationships. Many of us are in situations where we wish that things could be different. We are in situations where we wish that we could mend our relationships. We wish that we could mend certain problems in our lives. And so often when you face a challenge, right? You face a problem. The first thing we think is, how am I going to go to the means, the creation to fix my problem? 
So for example, I find that I'm sick. And the first thing I think about is which doctor should I call? And which medicine should I take? And while it is fine to call the doctor and to take the medicine, there is a problem in our dependency, in our dependence. Where do we put our trust? Where do we think the source of our solution really is? Do we really believe that our problems will be solved by the doctor or the medicine? Do we really believe that our relationship issues, our societal issues, our political issues are going to be solved through the means? We have to realize that the solution is in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the healing is in the Quran. When you look at the Quran as a healing, you can break it down into different categories. The Quran is a healing for two of the most common emotional problems that we suffer from. Two of the most common psychological problems, psychological challenges that we suffer from. And those are depression and anxiety. You notice that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Jannah. Again and again, Jannah is described, and Allah says, "La khawfun alayhim wa la hum yahzanun." La khawfun alayhim. There is no fear on them. Wa la hum yahzanun, nor shall they grieve. And so Allah addresses two emotions, doesn't He? The two very emotions that we suffer from most in this life. And that is fear and sadness. And Allah tells us that in Jannah there's no fear and there's no sadness. Addressing those two very, those two challenges that we face in this life most. But there's something else Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us. Is this freedom from ultimate fear and ultimate depression and sadness only saved for Jannah? Yes and no. Our perfect life, inshallah, is in Jannah. But does that mean that in this life we have to keep on suffering, keep on suffering until we get to Jannah? Not necessarily. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually gives us a medicine so that we don't have to suffer so much inside in this life also. Now we may suffer externally, and when I say suffer, I mean we will go through hardships. We will go through hardships. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us this. Allah says, we will surely test you of something of fear. And here, realize Allah is telling us that He gives us something of fear. Shay, it isn't all fear. It isn't fear like fear in the, in the hereafter fear. It's just a little bit of fear. And this is part of dunya, part of the test of dunya. Yes, we will go through hardships. And he says that we will test you with something of fear. You are going to experience this emotion. Why does Allah give us this test, however? When you continue these ayats, you realize that it is actually for our own good. So Allah says, we will surely test you something of fear and hunger and loss. Loss of what? Naqsun min al amwali wal anfusi wal thamarat. Loss of wealth and souls and fruits of your labor. You know that this life, sometimes we lose money. Sometimes we lose property. We lose things that we have. Sometimes we lose people in our lives, people that we love. And sometimes we lose something called results. 
Sometimes we put so much effort into something and it just doesn't turn out the way we want, right? You try so hard to mend a relationship and it still doesn't get mended. You try so hard to put together a program and it doesn't work out exactly the way you want it. You're trying, you're, you're putting your effort, but the result sometimes is lost. Thamarat, this is the result, this is the fruits. You know when a, when a farmer puts so much work, right? Has to put in so much work and in the end, what is it for? For the fruit. That's the result, that's the outcome. But sometimes we don't get that, we lose it. We tried, but we don't get an outcome, we don't see a result. And that is not always easy. And that's part of the test. But after all of this, Allah tells us something interesting. He says, وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ Give glad tidings to the patient ones. Have you ever seen someone who's going through a hardship and gone up to them and said, congratulations. Congratulations that you just lost your job. Or congratulations that you, you're going through this financial difficulty. We don't usually say that, right? Because we don't think about it like that. But here Allah is almost saying congratulations. He is saying glad tidings to them who are patient. And he's referring to those who have gone through those things, who have gone through loss, who have gone through something of fear, and who have gone through something of hunger. But to them he's giving glad tidings only to the patient ones. Who are these patient ones? الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّ لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّ إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ those who, when a hardship, a musiba, a calamity strikes them, they respond. They say, indeed, we belong to Allah and to Allah is our return. This statement, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon, is a very powerful statement. And it's not only a statement of the tongue. This is a statement which represents an entire paradigm, an entire way to see the world. And this paradigm, this response begins with Inna lillah, indeed we belong to Allah. When you believe that you belong to Allah, when you believe that everything you have is only a gift that is given to you on loan, it doesn't belong to you. When you know this, then your response when it is taken away is very different. Inna lillah. And so we begin with this concept. If we all realized that every single gift we have is only that, a gift. Then we would never respond with a statement like we just spoke about in the previous session, Allah is not fair. Billah. We would never respond with that if we knew that it all belongs to Allah. That would be like a person who lends you their car for a while and then after many years comes to take it back. And then you get very upset and say, that's not fair. How could that not be fair when it's my car? <laughs> this is how we respond to Allah. Allah gave us money, gave us health, gave us youth, gave us children, gave us spouses gave us a nice place to live. He gave us eyesight. He gave us hearing. He gave us all of these abilities which we completely take for granted, but then when they are taken, we say that's not fair. But Allah is taking back what was His. 
How can we say it's not fair? When you realize everything belongs to Allah, it is a healing for the heart because when it is taken, you can respond with patience and say and respond and react in a way that is inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Indeed, we belong to Allah and to Allah we return. That car, it belonged to you and it returns to you. I'm not going to say that's not fair. It wasn't mine. Remember that when something is taken from you, when things don't work out exactly the way you want, remember that Allah owns all of it. The next ayah gives us that. Why, why is this a good thing? Why the glad tidings? That for those people, there is the blessings of Allah, the mercy of Allah, and they are the rightly guided. So far in this ayah, Allah has mentioned three rewards for being patient in hardship. They are the blessings of Allah, the mercy of Allah, and guidance. Let me ask you a question. Can you quantify those three things? Can you put like a, a value on it? Like it's worth um, $10 billion. Can we put a value on the mercy of Allah? Can we put a limit, a value limit on guidance? Answer is obviously no. These are infinite, infinite gifts. And who are they saved for? They are being saved for those who when they are faced with hardship and calamity, they respond with inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raja'un. Indeed, we belong to Allah and to Allah is the return. Now, if I tell you that the fact that you're going through a hardship makes you qualified to win a hundred billion dollars, what would you say? Would you be depressed about your hardship anymore? You would see it in a different light, wouldn't you? You would see it in a different light. You'd say, mm, okay, I guess it's all right. In fact, maybe I'm lucky because I, I have the opportunity to get $100 billion. Well, okay, sure, what do I gotta do? Nothing, all you gotta do is be patient. Really? That's all? I just have to be patient? And yet Allah is not giving us a hundred billion dollars. Allah is not giving us any quantifiable gift. This is infinite. And the reward is infinite for something small. That's why Allah is actually honoring you when He gives you something that is difficult, when he gives you a hardship, he is giving you an opportunity to gain something priceless. The mercy, the guidance, and the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we understood life in this way, our response to difficulty, our response to loss, our response to hardship would be completely transformed. If we looked at the world in this way, our hearts would become healed. Because we would understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always means good for us. And the matter of a believer is always good. How does the Quran heal anxiety? Remember how I was talking about fear and sadness and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, that there is no fear on them, nor shall they grieve. 
But it's interesting because Allah actually tells us this in another place in the Quran also. We are told the story of our beginning, right? Where did we start out? We started out in Jannah, right? Our father and mother, original father and mother, Adam and Hawa السلام, started in Jannah. And then we ended up coming to this life. In that process of coming from Jannah to this life, we went from a perfect, perfect life, a perfect world, to a lower life, dunya. It is the lower life. In this process, Allah tells us something in the Quran. He, when He told Adam to go down, He said that there will come to you a guidance from Me, and whoever follows My guidance, فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ There will be no fear on them, nor shall they grieve. You see, when you follow the guidance of Allah, you become healed from this, even in this life. From this paralyzing fear and paralyzing sadness and despair. That happens in this life before the next life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a healing for our fears and our anxiety. What causes us to be afraid? What causes us to be afraid is the fact that we don't want to lose the things that we love, right? But let me ask you this question. What if I told you that you could go and seek protection from a king who was all powerful and that king would ensure that you would never lose your money, you would never lose anything valuable to you. Would you be afraid anymore? You would feel secure because now you have a protector, right? And this protector is very powerful. What if you entrusted someone with your, with your money? Now, if the one who you entrusted isn't so reliable, are you going to continue to be afraid? Yes, if the person you entrusted is not reliable, you will continue to be afraid. You'll still have anxiety inside, right? But what if the person you have entrusted is extremely reliable and never ever would let you down? Then do you continue to have anxiety? Would you continue to be afraid? No. You see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of His attributes is al-wakil. And al-wakil, the meaning of al-wakil is the trustee, the one who, who you have entrusted, the most trusted trustee, right? So if we entrust Allah, if we have our trust in Allah, we've already given everything to Him for him to take care of, would we still have anxiety inside? Afraid? The reason why we have anxiety is because of a deficiency in tawakkul, a deficiency in trust and dependence on Allah. What else do we become afraid of? We become afraid about losing our provision. We become afraid about losing or not getting our provision, right? So for example, we might sit and worry about what's going to happen to my children, what's going to happen about my business, you know, my money that I'm losing, am I making enough money in my... You know, this is the stuff that, that makes us afraid, that we stay up at night worrying about. But what if you knew that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the provider. And no matter what happens to you, whether you have money in the bank or you don't, Allah is still there. Would you still feel anxious inside? Because you know that your provider never stops. Your provision never stops. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never sleeps and never gets tired. He is Ar-Razzaq. 
Now, the last type of healing that I want to discuss is a healing for our relationships. One of the biggest cause of pain for us is sometimes difficulty in our relationships. Whether it is in our marriage or with our families, with our friends. The, he the Quran comes down as a healing for those relationships. How? Because the Quran teaches us something revolutionary. And that is... The Quran teaches us a way to love and interact with the creation that is healthy, that is not based in false dependency, that is not based in selfishness, that is not based in neediness, but is based instead in the love and trust of Allah. The Quran gives us a a new way to love gives us a completely liberating way to love it is love for the sake of Allah it is love for the sake of Allah when you love someone for the sake of Allah it transforms your relationship I'm gonna give you just some specifics You know this concept of love for the sake of Allah, it always sounds very conceptual, it's hard to, uh, theoretical, it's hard to sort of understand what it really means. I think one of the best ways to explain it is think about the difference between a person who is rich and a person who is poor. The difference between a rich person and a beggar. Now the rich person already has so much wealth. So now when the rich person interacts with you, they are in a position to be generous. Correct? They are in a position to give. Why? Because they have so much. Now think about the beggar. The one who has, who's bankrupt inside, who's bankrupt, doesn't have money, now, how do they interact with you? They beg. They're needy. They're dependent on what you have to give them. Correct? Because they're poor. They don't have money. So when they come and interact with you, it's, it's, it's the type of interaction is always taking. It's an interaction where they're always taking. Give me. I need. I'm dependent. Now, how does that, what does that have to do with relationships? Now, go back and apply that to emotional richness and emotional bankruptcy. Emotional neediness. When I love for the sake of Allah, it means that I am not being filled by you. I am not expecting from you. I am not dependent on you to make me feel good about myself, happy, complete, approval, love, respect. I'm not dependent on you to give me those things. You know why? Because I already get those things from Allah. I am already rich when I am filled by Allah. Imagine a person whose bank account is full. So now, they don't need anything from you. In fact, they are in a position to give and be generous. That is the concept of love for the sake of Allah. That when I, for example, enter a marriage, and my expectation from that marriage is that this other person needs to fill me and complete me and make me happy and make me feel good about myself and everything that was broken inside of me, now you need to fix it. That's a lot of expectations. 
And that is not something another person can do for you. That is not something another person can do for you. One of the biggest problems is we, that we have in terms of marriage is this false expectation. It is false on so many levels. The idea that they sell you in Hollywood and Bollywood and all other woods is that when you get married, Prince Charming or whatever is going to complete you, is going to save you, is going to now fix everything that was broken. And as soon as you get married, you automatically get transported to Jannah, right? Everything's perfect after that. You know what happily ever after means, right? We think about marriage in this very bizarre way. It's bizarre because, because we think that somehow marriage is going to fix everything. That somehow finding our soulmate, and I do believe that, I do believe that we, in the concept of soulmates, and I'll explain that. But this idea that we find our soulmate, and then that person is going to be my savior. That person's going to fix everything for me. I wasn't happy for the all the rest of my life. All of a sudden, I'm going to be happy. Well, you're in for a big surprise. And this is when people crash. Complete disappointment because you had a false you know, unreasonable expectation. You're expecting a human being to be like Allah. You're expecting a human being to heal you. Only Allah can heal you. You're expecting a human being to complete you. Only Allah can complete you. You're expecting a human being to save you. And only Allah can save you. No Prince Charming can do it. No Prince Charming can save you. It's a myth that we're taught since we're like two. You know, because Cinderella, she was like this poor, abused child. And then, how does she get saved? Well, all she's got to do is look pretty at a party. That's all she has to do. She just has to wear the prettiest dress. She has to be in the prettiest dress. She has to be the most beautiful girl. And that's it. They don't even have a conversation. <laughs> he just picks out the prettiest girl in the room. And it happens to be Cinderella because a bunch of birds helped her make her dress. <laughs> so he picks her out for very, very, you know, substantial reasons. She's got the prettiest dress and she's the prettiest face. How much could he know about her soul? They didn't even talk. They like danced. So he decides, you know what? You're pretty. So I want to marry you. Well, that's a really great message. But since you're pretty and I want to marry you, now your life's going to be perfect. Right? You used to be this abused child who was like a maid for your sisters and your stepsisters and your stepmother, like a little, like a slave for them. And now you're going to be the princess, right? Because it's like a prince. What's the message there? Well, first of all, that all your problems are going to be solved when a man comes into your life. And second of all, you got to be pretty to get that to happen. And if you're not, then you're like the stepsisters. They don't get anybody. Because they were ugly. Remember? Their feet were too big, couldn't fit the slipper. They were like, they had ugly dresses or whatever. They weren't as pretty as her. I mean, completely poisonous messages. Cinderella. Now look at Sleeping Beauty. <laughs> look, 
whoa, she's like basically dead in a coma. And all she needs is for a man to come kiss her. And once he kisses her, she comes back to life, dude. She comes back to life. From a coma. So what's the message there? <laughs> oh, goodness. Your life doesn't truly begin until you meet that man or that person. You know, everything else is just one big coma. You know, all your life before you get married, it's just a big coma. <laughs> And then when you get married or you meet that Prince Charming, now you're going to begin your life. And by the way, it's going to be perfect. It's going to be perfect because now it's happily ever after. Snow White. First of all, she's like some sort of slave to like seven little men. That's really interesting. And she has the same issue. First of all, you notice that what is in common with all these women, they're all the most, what? Beautiful. Because beauty is linked to goodness in these messages. You have to be beautiful to be good. So we have a problem here because Snow White is more beautiful than the queen. And she's really upset. Because beauty is all that matters, right? These are the messages we grew up with. And then what happens to her? Again, she eats from some apple or something. She's also like half dead. And again, who saves her? A man. It's not like these women, you know, find God. <laughs> it's not like these women, you know, go and like try to help themselves. No, no, no. They're completely helpless until a man comes to save them, bring them back to life, all these kinds of strange things. Last I checked, only God could do those things, right? But no, somehow these men can do these things. Alhamdulillah, we're changing a bit, you know, in Frozen at least. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. No, this is good. This is good. We're changing. Um, there, the act of love was between her and her sister. Wallahu Akbar. Alhamdulillah. And that's what saved her. And what was interesting about that is that it was her act of selflessness. It was a true act of love for her sister that she sacrificed herself for her sister. These are good Good, good qualities. It wasn't just being beautiful and getting kissed by a guy. Because actually the guy turned out to be a big, you know, um, fake, right? You can't marry a man you just met. It's like, um, that's what happens in every other fairy tale, right? Cinderella, she married a man she just met. S Sleeping Beauty, that was interesting. These messages are very poisonous. And although it's funny and it's just a fairy tale, but we have internalized these messages at some level. Yes, we have. I'll, I, I will tell you, yes, we have. I mean, I'm also a victim of these, all, these, all this too. But I've also been married for a while, so I learned about the difference between these false images and then you know, reality and how it is that we are supposed to, what is it that we actually should be expecting from our marriages? Never go to the creation to fill you. Never go to the creation to complete you or to save you. Only go to Allah for those things. Only go to Allah for those things. Only go to Allah to save you or complete you or fill you. And when you do that, you become like the rich person. 
the one who now is already full inside. So when you get married, you're not that beggar. You see? You're not that beggar who's begging from your spouse. Oh, come on, give me, give me, give me. That is exhausting. But instead, you're already full. And now you can be generous. You can be a more generous spouse, a more generous friend, a more generous daughter or son. Because you're not a beggar anymore. You get filled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This will revolutionize relationships. It completely transforms relationships. Love for the sake of Allah means, I love you because of Allah. I don't love you because you feed me, fill me, complete me, anything. I love you because of Allah. And because I love you because of Allah, I want to give to you. This is generous love. This is not needy love. This is not dependent love. This is a healthy kind of love. This is how the Quran heals our relationships. This is how this concept heals our relationships. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to heal our hearts, to heal our relationships, to heal our society. And remember that when you change yourself, you find change in your world.